If you've got your Bibles, I want you to invite you to go to Daniel chapter 4. If you're a guest, I'm so glad that you're here. If you're a guest and you don't have a church, welcome home. You do now. We just are glad that you're here. You don't have to do a dance. You don't have to impress us. You don't have to try to, if you will, uh, uh, earn a right to be here. Oh my goodness, you're in the house of God and we're just glad that you're here. Just be you and we'll let God do what he said he would do. And I just believe he'll show up in a mighty way. And I just want to put our people out there in advance. I'm, I'm just going to stick you out in the middle of the street, celebrators. If you're a guest and you don't feel loved here, then please don't come back because we failed as a church. If we're going to call ourselves Christians and when the service is over and we're quicker to run to the door because there's something that we have to do instead of reaching out and welcoming them other people, then we really shouldn't be God's church. The bottom line of the church, it will grow as the people grow. It will grow as the people give. It will grow as the people live out the way Jesus loves us. And the more that we do that, I'm telling you, this is the place that people want to be. And so if you're a guest, I'm glad that you're here. And you're going to be loved in this service. I'm just going to stick our people out there. You're going to be loved. And uh, so um, I, I'm just welcome. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to get you one. Uh, if you have one, please start bringing it because uh, that's so important because this is what it's all about. If you want to experience everything that God has, then you have to be people that get into the word of God. If you're sitting right now saying, well, I don't need to be a Christian, you're completely missing it. In fact, I'll just say this. I don't think you're saved. Some of you go, well, I won't make people come back. I'm just telling you right up front. Jesus said, it's by the word of God that we grow. Jesus said that. It's through the living word of God. As we read it, it begins to change us. It is powerful, the Bible says, like a two-edged sword. It will cut through. It will do things that you can't even begin to imagine. This is alive. Amen. And we need to be in it. Now, I know those are tough words, but they're not really. They're just the words of Jesus. That's what Jesus said. You can't just live on bread alone. You just can't live in McDonald's and Burger King and somehow think that you're going to experience life. Okay? That's what the Bible says. You can eat three score meals a day and it can be great. And yeah, your body's being nourished, but your spirit's not. And when you get to heaven, it isn't the body by which we live. It's the spirit by which we live. And so, by the way, no matter how much you feed your body, it's all going to die anyway. Isn't that just true? And someone else is going to eat it. Okay? All right? And I won't tell you who that is, but you'll figure it out yourself, I'm sure. Um, but but I, I, I want to live by the Spirit, and we need to be in the Word. And that's what I want to do is I want to help you as your pastor is to help you grow and for the Word of God to come alive. And with that being said, let me just tell you two things that have just meant so much to me. Last week, and I was given a stack of cards by so many of you. And it literally took Kay and I about three to four days to go through a wall because I don't want to hurry through them. And so we'd read a little bit and then we just kind of put them down, read a little more. And first of all, I want to tell you this over and over. I kept hearing you talking about how the word of God is changing your life. What greater joy for a pastor to hear than that? Please hear this. There wasn't a lot of, oh, pastor, we just love you. The words that were just really meaningful to me were all the words that were saying, thank you for teaching the word. The word is changing my life. I'm falling more in love with Jesus. And I tell you, it just made me smile. The second thing that was so cool, over and over, another thread all the way through was how many people said, my life group is one of the greatest things that I'm a part of. Oh my goodness, was that warm in my heart. Over and over, people were talking about how their life group and the people around them and how it's changing them as they look at the word of God together. So I can't tell you enough how proud I am of you. How incredibly proud. And so praise God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So look at some right now and say, man, you're a stud. You're a stud. Okay, go ahead. For all of you politically correct people right now, look at someone and say, oh, no, I'm sorry. You're a studette. <laughs> okay. But I want to ask this. How many here want to be successful? Oh, my goodness. Come on. How many here want to, be, admit it, want to be successful? Well, of course you do. We all want to be successful. I do, we do. It's the American dream, isn't it? 
It's one of the great things about this country. Amen. Is this incredible? Amen. But maybe the greater question is why? I think therein lies the problem. Why do you want to be successful? And, and don't, don't, don't answer this. Because you might indict your own heart because God knows our deeper thoughts. He knows true motivation. But I hear people say, I, I want to be successful because I, I want to help others. I want to be successful because I want to give more. Sounds great. Sounds wonderful. The only problem is we're not seeing a lot of that. Because here's the reality. If you're not helping people now, you won't help them then. I said it a moment ago. If you're not giving now, you won't give then. That's just dishonesty. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that you've got to have before you can give. Because the fact that you have Jesus, you have everything you need to already start giving. So what is it about us? What is the deeper motivation about success? Can I help you with something? Maybe the problem is because God really doesn't want us to be successful in the way we understand success, but maybe God wants us to be significant. See, I think people want to be successful because they think success will give them significance. Rather than being a person of significance and realizing when you're significant, you're already now successful. Are you with me on this? I think you'll appreciate this story. A pastor was asked to speak for a certain charitable organization. After the meeting, the program chairman handed the pastor a check by which he was giving him an honorarium for speaking. Oh, I couldn't take that said the pastor with some embarrassment, trying to appear humble. I appreciate the honor of being asked to speak. You have better uses for that money, don't you? How about you apply it to one of those? The program chairman took the check back and said, well, do you mind if we put it in our special fund? The pastor said, well, of course not. What's the special fund? The chairman said, it's so we can get a better speaker next year. <laughs> Kind of a game changer, isn't it? <laughs> but maybe that would be good if that was all our story. See, I think too often we're chasing something that would provide us an identity than realizing that in Christ we already have the identity. And therefore, I don't need something out here to tell me who I am who I am now allows me to go out and be something out there. This is our story in the book of Daniel. I, I want to say this in preferring or prefacing this. You and I not, are not made for success. Did you know that? <laughs> you and I have nothing in us that's made for success. Therein lies the problem because most people, when they get it, don't know how to handle it. Which I've already told you that the more you make, the less that you give. That's true in this country. <laughs> the greatest givers are those they call blue collar. Isn't that interesting? But the more you have, the less you give percentage wise. Because you and I are not made for success. That's why the more we have, the more we stand to lose. So the more we hold on, thinking if I just had a little more then. But you and I are not made for sex. Nobody in this world can handle success. God made sure there's only one name above all names. Only one can handle success. Because if you think you can, you've already missed what I just said because you think you're him. There's only one name above all names. And every successful person who thinks they're successful, you ready for this, will bow before him and will confess that he is Lord. But we are made for significance. 
our lives do matter and our lives do count. Abraham Lincoln once said, nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power, give him success. And you'll learn real quickly what we're talking about. So in Daniel chapter 4, I want to just simply say that up until this point, Nebuchadnezzar is the most successful man on the planet. He's the most successful man on the planet. But let me tell you how it happened. See, it happened when he was young. He was the general of his daddy's army. His dad was the emperor. And he appointed his son to be the man over all of his armies. And he single-handedly defeated the Assyrians, led the Babylonian people into battle, which then was the most powerful city. With, with that victory, Babylon became the most powerful known city and the most powerful known country in its time. And guess who's king of the mountain? Nebuchadnezzar. He comes home and people are shouting his praise. And as you can imagine, his daddy dies, and guess who's the next in line to be emperor? Nebuchadnezzar. He's the man. He's the guy sitting on top. And he builds himself the most amazing city you can imagine. And we all know that one of them, and part of it, became one of the seventh wonders of the world. And that's the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. But he had a problem. We're not made for success. We're made for significance. And now he's singing the praises of God, but the only problem is, is something happens when you start getting successful. And it happens to every one of us because we're not made for success. We're made for significance. He had a pride issue. Would you just spell that on your note somewhere? P-R-I-D-E. Isn't that wild enough? God knew what he was doing when he made us, and yet none of us in this room are happy with just two eyes. <laughs> we, we like a little more. We like I. By the way, the middle letter of pride is what? I. Anybody know what the middle letter of sin is? I. I. He had a pride issue. And so as we launch this chapter, we're 32 years after chapter 2 now, Roughly around 32 years when he had his first dream. You might remember that Daniel interprets that dream. And his life is spared along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's life. At least in that moment. But God is fed up with Nebuchadnezzar. And by the way, it will happen to so many. It's called death. Chase all you want. Jesus said what? And I'll say it again. You can gain the whole world but lose yourself. And if we read here, we'll know that God is done with Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, Daniel approaches him and said, you wouldn't heed God's warning. Over and over, God tried to show you, but you wouldn't listen. So God's going to remove you as king. But not only is he going to remove you as king, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to lose your mind. You're going to lose your mind. But there's good news. Daniel says, if you'll repent right now and begin trusting God, God will spare your life. You can avoid all this, but Nebuchadnezzar does nothing. He does nothing, and he ends up becoming homeless and goes insane. And so I want to read a few verses from Daniel 4, because we're going to talk about how does success mess so many people's lives up. Have you ever noticed that? How does success from the world standard just keep messing so many people's lives up? And it does. Now, please hear this. I'm not talking about being wealthy. I'm talking being controlled by your wealth. I'm not talking about being popular. I'm talking about when you're the center of your world rather than God. See, you can go out and do great things for God, but it must be done for God, for his glory. Amen. And everything that you get, you honor God back because of the incredible gratitude that you wouldn't have it in the first place if it wasn't for God. Amen. There's no self-made men in this room. If you are, 
good luck. Because if you self-made yourself, I guess you're going to have to die for self. You're going to have to resurrect self. Because everything you have is because of God. See, I told you this is going to be a tough subject. Because we, we in this country, we like success more than we should. And we lost our significance the way we were built. And I'm going to show you how that happens, but I can show you how it can all be changed too. It's right here in this story. So if you got your Bibles, Daniel chapter 4, here's the first verse. King Nebuchadnezzar, you might remember that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were spared from the fire. And it did something to Nebuchadnezzar. But even in that, listen to that. Wonderful, godly Christians can grow amazingly carnal in Christ. Wonderful, godly people can wander from the faith. And so the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs. How powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever. His rule through all generations. It sounds so good and it's true for the moment. But something really tragic happens. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in bed. So I issued an order calling in all of the wise men of Babylon. So they could tell me what the dream meant. Isn't that interesting? You might remember in the previous chapter, guess who he called in again? Chapter 2, who did he call in? It's like he never learns his lesson. How many Christians today step into church and they praise God, but they go back into the world? And they step into church, they go back into the world. He's such an awesome God. And then they go right back, living the ways of the world. He calls in all the people he shouldn't have called into. All the ones who couldn't help him before that won't be able to help him now. And what's crazy is they become the wise ones. Look what it says. When all the magicians, the enchanters, the astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel comes in. And I told him the dream. And I told him the dream. I said to him, Daniel, chief of the magicians... <laughs> I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. He tells Daniel the dream. And then if you jump over to verse 19, upon hearing this, Daniel was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. Then the king said to him, Daniel, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. And Daniel replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. And then Daniel tells him what the dream meant. Verse 28, but all these things happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on a flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon as he looked out across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. Here's the problem. <laughs> By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. You know how many people stop and go, look what I built. Look what I've done. Wow. We'll come back to that verse in a moment. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You're no longer ruler of this kingdom. You'll be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdom of the world and gives to them anyone he chooses. That same hour, the judgment was fulfilled, and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow, 
and he was drenched with the dew of the heavens. He lived this way until his hair was as long as the eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. We're going to walk through this. How in the world does success become such a downfall for so many? Well, here's the first one I want you to write down, and here it is. It's as simple as this. You grow comfortable. It's just so easy to get comfortable. Isn't that what we chase? I'm going to do all of this, and one day I'm going to retire, and I'm going to set back, and I'm not going to do nothing. I work so hard to get to a place where it's, it's going to be about me. I get comfortable. Isn't that what happens? Because when you now have, <laughs> what do you need? And it happens in so many ways. Daniel 4.4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity. I'm enjoying this incredible time. Isn't that why we elect people into office? Would you please lower the taxes so I have the relief? Would you please fix the health care so I don't have to keep pouring out? Those are great things to vote for, but those things won't change your life. I'm enjoying a time of peace and prosperity in my kingdom, in palace, my kingdom. I was taking it easy without a care in the world. I mean, think about it as Christians. Let's just play it out. When do we pray? In times of pleasure and prosperity or in the face of our problems? Isn't that the most time people pray? Very few times do people come and say, Pastor, just pray for me. I'm like, why? I just want to, I just need prayer all the time. Very, I mean, I very rarely ever have someone say it. Most times it's this, my life has fallen apart. This bad thing happened. My kids are a mess. And now you want God to get involved. And then those same people, well, I prayed, where was God? I don't know, same place when you weren't praying. When, when do we most often call out to God? When things are great or when life is at stake? I told you we're going to go back to that verse. Look at verse 30 again. Look what it says. I said to myself, just look at this great city Babylon I have created. I, by my own mighty power, have built this beautiful city for my glory. I built it to show my power, my might, my majesty, my glory. Do you just notice how many selfish pronouns are there? Me, me, me. Folks, never forget the lesson of the well. When you're finally at the top and you're ready to blow, that's when they harpoon you. Don't miss the lesson. I told you, I spelled it out. The middle letter of pride, the middle letter of sin is I. And Proverbs says this, pride leads to destruction and arrogance to your downfall. And I will tell you this, when I'm prideful, I'm always on the opposite side of God. Because the Bible says when you're humbled, he can lift you up. When you, you know what humility is? I need God. In bad days, in good days, every day. I need God because that's where my life and source and meaning and purpose comes from. Amen. But how do we get worldly? How do we get successful? How does it mess up so many? We grow comfortable. But here's the second thing that happens. Once you get comfortable, you now become careless. You get careless to the warning sides. Can I just be honest with you about a story? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Y'all just like, well, I already checked out faster. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I got a ticket for speeding. And I didn't do anything. I was speeding, but you have to understand, I, I was on the phone with, a, with, a, with someone, and, and it was a very important phone call, and, and I'm not talking to you. Anyway, and so, see, I'm preaching, I'm talking at you, you listen. No. <laughs> see, I'm dead in rights, aren't I? I'm already in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> you see how it happens? 
But I'm like, I, I, I really didn't mean to. Because if I was out, there's a school they built out in, in out there by Uncle Ed's area out there, and there's a little road back through there. Well, I don't know who's the idiot that made the speed limit all the way through until you get to this, this, the, the school zone. They put it clear back where the school don't even exist. So I was thinking, I'm fine, So I because I, I, I really work hard too, so I set the cruise at 55. <laughs> and then I saw this, the school zone coming up, so I slowed down. And that's when I realized as I'm going through school zone, my goodness, I, I'm hearing somebody and I look and I'm like, oh, so I, I pull over. But I was like, I gotta be, I was a little upset. And I told the guy, I said, listen, I, I said, can I explain this to you? And he said, sure. And so I told him what was going on. And I said, my goodness, you know, I'm a pastor. We, we teach grace. And so, <laughs> and, 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 and he wrote me a ticket. So I did something I've never done. I called up a lawyer friend of mine and I told the city lawyer, I said, I gotta tell you what's going on. He said, I'll look at your case, pastor, no problem. A couple days later, he called me back and said, I've reviewed your case. And I looked at the camera the officer had in his vehicle and the signs are clearly marked. I can't help you. <laughs> But isn't that what it happens when it comes to success and about ourselves? We grow careless. And we start thinking we can skirt this a little bit. But Jesus, on behalf of God, says, Keith, I reviewed my father's camera. I, I can't help you. Sin is sin. We grow careless. Proverbs 14 says, A wise man is cautious and turns from evil, but a fool is careless. But a fool is careless. Isn't it interesting how sensitive we are when our arm is broken? <laughs> but how careless and how much we take it for granted when it's not? And we forget we're broken. And we need Jesus. Amen. And somehow we think we can get away with things. Listen to this very carefully. It's not the dark that blinds us. It's the spotlight. It's the spotlight. See, this is a story not about a king in Babylon. It's about you and I right here in our own Babylon. Can I just throw this out there? That's why I think it pays for some of you maybe to mow your own lawn, change a diaper, do the laundry, wash some dishes, you know, the real stuff that real people do. <laughs> kind of keeps you in touch with reality. Just because you make more doesn't mean you need to own more. So then you don't have to do more. Jesus washed feet, and I think he's the one who had everything. Verse 27, so Daniel, here's what you need to do. You need to repent of your sin and start doing what is right. Then begin to show mercy, kindness to the poor and oppressed. Then God will allow you to keep prospering. Isn't that interesting? Then God will reconnect you to your success because now you're living a life of significance. Notice what, what, what Daniel says. First, Nebuchadnezzar, repent repent. In other words, change your attitude, change the way you think. And then secondly, I find it interesting. He says, then serve the poor. Amen. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus said, what? You want to be first, then be last. You want to be great, then serve. Just like I do to you. That's what Jesus said. Folks, the surest way to get your attention off you and off your success and what you've accomplished is put others before you and serve them. Mother Teresa, <laughs> the good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. 
She went on to say, your true character is most accurately measured by how you treat others who can do nothing for you in return. That's a great word. Proverbs 14 says, if you want to be happy, be kind to the poor. It is a sin to despise anyone. Is this good stuff? Here's the third thing that happens. We ultimately grow carnal. When you get comfortable, you get careless. When you get careless, you get carnal. You know what carnality is? It's living like the world rather than according to the word. It's living in the flesh rather than walking in the spirit. It's when you don't do the right things, you'd rather do the popular thing. And I'll say it again. One plus God is always the majority. You do what God wants you to do. Daniel 4, 28, look what it says. 12 months later, all of what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed did actually happen. He was taking a walk. He was taking a walk on a flat roof of his royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, he boasted to himself. And as the words were still on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what God decrees. Your power is being taken away and you're no longer the ruler of the kingdom. And immediately it happened. And immediately, I'm gonna, I'll keep saying this. You're not taking anything with you. America alone and the church people in the pews that say they have a church home, if they would tithe in less than a year, we would erase the national debt and we would take care of poverty around the world. The power of what God's blessed us in this country and what America could do, just God's people alone. If we got real serious about what we have and gave accordingly and quit chasing what the world says is success and start living a life of significance and recognizing to God that is success. Amen. There's hope, folks. And I want, to re I want to give them to you real quick. There's a hope, unbelievable hope. Today can be a brand new day for you. How do we keep this from happening? Even if it's already happened, how do we get back on the right track? Well, here's the first one. Just write it in. You've got to wake up to God. And I'm talking literally figuratively and literally. Figuratively, we need to wake up and smell the roses. We need to get out of our beds of comfort and get into the game of Christ. we got to wake up. But we also have to do it literally. Each morning, remind ourselves all that God has given us. And he's worthy of the praise. For it's his way that you start the day. Yeah. Folks, that's what we need to do. I love what chapter 4, verse 34 says. I told you we're going to read this. Look what it says in verse 34. My sanity has returned. This is what Nebuchadnezzar says. He's eating grass like a cow. He's realizing, oh my goodness. I gave up all of that for this. And it says this. He says, my sanity is returned. I'm waking up. I get it. And I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. We got to wake up. We got to wake up. Look at someone right now and say, wake up. Come on. All right. Okay, do it figuratively and literally because they might be asleep. Okay. All right. <laughs> Folks, listen to this. We always get better. You ready for this? Great line. We always get better when we replace pride with praise. Amen. Amen. Oh, I love it. We always get better. By the way, notice where the middle letter of I in praise is. It's just off to the right of A for Almighty. Praise. Get rid of the pride and praise. Wake up. Here's number two. You got to look up to God. You got to not only wake up, you got to look up. See, waking up isn't enough. You got to get back to God being the focus, God being the center, God being everything. Verse 34 says, after this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned. I looked up to heaven. I, look, I woke up, but I looked up. Folks, listen. Life is about here, not about here. Amen? It's about here. It's about here. It starts with significance. I find my identity in Christ, and out of that identity, I will find success in Christ. 
Folks, when we make our lives count for God, it's then we're living success. But then this third one. So you got to wake up. You got to look up. Here's number three. But you got to speak up. This is huge. You have to speak up and tell others what God has done. When you start to share, it's then you're now really aware. Because we all talk about what's most important. You ready for this? If you want to know if you've really woke up and you're looking up, ask yourself, what am I speaking up about? If you're sitting in the coffee shop talking with other men or other women about the ugly of the world or how your stocks and all of that's going up or down, you're not woke up yet. Because if he returned in that moment, it wouldn't mean a hill of bins. The question is, are those in the circle, or are they all going to heaven, really? What do they talk about? All the things they find wrong in the world are all the things they find incredibly right in their relationship with God. The Bible says in verse 4, I want to go, or verse 1, I want to go back. It's too bad he forgot this. He sent a letter to the people and pronounced what? Every race, every nation, every language throughout the world, and he praises God. It's too bad he didn't stay there. But he let it get comfortable. He let himself get careless, and he turned carnal. Man, imagine if he'd have stayed true to that. How many times in the church? People, starters are a dime a dozen, but finishers are one in a million. You got to stay the course. You got to wake up, look up, but you got to start speaking up. So let me just ask you this. Has God done anything good for you? Has he saved you from anything worthwhile? Has he shown his grace to you in any way? Is it worth talking about? Then why aren't you? If you're not. See, I, I'm not born with this courage to stand up and tell people about Jesus. I, I'm not born with being in front of people and finding great confidence in that. But I surrender my life to Almighty God and He filled me with His Spirit that gave me that courage and confidence. I want to tell people about it. I want them to know Jesus. Because he's the answer. Amen, Amen to that? Amen. I want to invite the team to the stage. And I want to just really ask yourself. And I'm going to ask you to really get honest with yourself and, and, and just really meditate on this as we're closing. We're going to open up the altar. And I think this is a, a subject we need to really get serious about. Does God really have everything that you have? Now, don't answer that out loud. Could God come in the night and as easy as we're talking right now, he go, I want you to sell everything you have. Come follow me. Would you wake up the next morning and say, sweetheart, <laughs> we're going to sell the house. You might go, well, well, maybe she's not on the page. If she's seeking the same God, she will be. Because God doesn't split homes. But I'll say that right back. Ladies, would that be your heart for your mate? Are you willing to keep sacrificing weekend worship to make your kids everything you think they need to be? Now they're part of this league and they're part of this league and they're part of this league. <laughs> but they're never understanding what it means to be in the house of God. And then we wonder why they get to a place in their lives and they don't see the church relevant because it never was when they were growing up. You're really seeking him because he said, if you'll seek me, you'll find me. Are you still trying to force a friendship or a relationship, compromising incredible values, moral values, ethical values, 
spiritual values. When do we realize that in Him we find great significance and there's nothing in this world that has anything to offer? I'm not going to chase it. Because in Jesus, I get everything. And in that significance, I get to experience success like nobody else. Brent Norgard is on our staff. He's on vacation right now. He's with his wife, Mindy, and they're out seeing their children and family. And just so proud of him. I remember the day that he told me he felt called to ministry. And I said, why are you waiting? You know what he told me? He said, do you know what I make? He then told me, and it was a lot of money, a lot of money. I said, well, if you want to keep counting widgets, keep counting widgets. Because <laughs> nothing you're doing is going to last. You're only going to find it when you get real about this call. I said, whether you go into ministry full time or not, what you own doesn't define anything and it doesn't impress me, my friend. I love you. We've been meeting a long time up to that point. I remember the day he called me and he was tears. He could hear it on the phone. He was broken. He said, my wife and I, can we come see you? I said, yeah, what's up? And he said, they let me go today. I had to put the phone away because I was like, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Come on over. Come on over. And he did, just come on in. He come walking into my office. I'm not kidding. That truly happened. Because I'm not going to feel sorry for people that lose things of the world. I'm just not. If that bothers you, then I'm sorry. I won't ever do it. Because my God will satisfy every need you can ever imagine. Amen. I just am. He came into my office. He and Mindy sat down and I, had, I leaned up on my desk like this. So I had a huge smile on my face. <laughs> I had a little guilt for a moment. And then finally I took it away and I said, it's about time, my friend. And his wife snapped and looked at me and I said, we've been waiting for a long time, Mindy. God's call is on his life. That I think happened on a Thursday, if I remember right. On Monday, he started working for us. He lost a lot of friends in the business world. Do you know why? Because they would say, what are you doing? They'd walk up and go, you're, what are you doing? You need to stay in the business world where you're so successful. What are you doing working for a church? And you know what Brent would say? And he'll say it to this day. He'll say, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. He told these friends, he said the same words I said. He said, you know, you go to work every day. You collect a paycheck. He said, what you don't understand is I get the greatest raise you could ever get every day of my life. That's what he says. He's never looked back. He's thinking about retiring in Phoenix. And he says, when I do, I want to plant a church there. I want a pastor. I just want to help everybody I can find Jesus. He's a man. And every weekend when he's here, he holds children in the nursery. I can tell you the story because what you need to know is that Brent was mar married once before, before Mindy. He had two children out of that marriage. He had a four-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. And in one phone call, he discovered that neither one were his. And the moment that happened, she took the kids and he never saw them again. Brent can tell you about pain. He can tell you about incredible loss. He can tell you and he would say it as freely as I'm telling you right now. But he would say, my God is so good. God blessed him in his second marriage with Mindy and they had two children. And he just loves being a dad and he loves pouring into those children and he loves holding them and he's Uncle Brent to so many children in this church. All I'm telling you is this, is I don't know what's going on in your life. You can gain the whole world and you can lose everything you got and you will. But you can take everything you got and realize it's a blessing for God, from God and give it away in a gratitude and an attitude. It's the most amazing thing. And watch what God can do. I've never asked you to do anything except what God asked. I've simply said tithe. 
10% of you got, you return it back to God. That's all I've asked you to do. And see what God will do. And just see what God will do. I just simply asked you to serve because Jesus said that. Just lay your life down and think of others more important than yourself. That's all I've asked. The Bible says never forsake the assembling of the body and meeting together and having a life group. So I've simply said, just get in a life group. That's all I've said. I'll never ask you to do more than what the Bible says. But in the obedience, I think you'll discover that God will do more than you could ever fathom or imagine. And the significance, it's amazing. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the word. And I believe that you're moving in people's lives. And God, we need to heed the words that you, that Daniel shared to Nebuchadnezzar that day. Repent. Repent and go serve and give your life away. Two simple instructions to repent and give your life away and watch how it'll return. God, I pray that as the team sings that we would take a moment and we would come and let others pray with us. We don't have to share in detail. We don't have to do any of that. You already know. But for others just to come along and put their hand on or hold the hand or just bow ahead and pray the power in that. Maybe someone needs to come and this is a day to say, I want to serve that Jesus. I just want to experience the love of God and watch what he can do.